Good evening, folks. Thank you for joining us tonight. We'll just give it a few seconds to allow everyone to come on in. Good, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Well, good afternoon or good morning, depending on which time zone you're joining us from. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you all here. Hi, Leonard. Nice to see you again. Glad you're able to join our virtual tour this afternoon as well as this evening. Hi, Larissa. Okay, I think we'll make a start. Well, good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the online Nature Trek Roadshow. I'm Sarah Frost, and I'm Nature Trek's marketing manager, and I'm very much looking forward to our evening ahead, where we'll be visiting Chile, Argentina, and Peru's Western Andes. And this is an area of fantastic scenery that we're going to be covering tonight. Uh, it's also an area of rapidly changing environments where the climate ranges from subtropical in the north to subpolar in the far south. And it's a land of harsh deserts to vast rainforests, towering snow-capped volcanoes, plateaus, coastal mountains, and of course, fantastic wildlife. And joining me this evening to take us on our journey to southern South America, are Nature Trek's operations manager, Paul Stanbury. Good evening. Leader Tim Melling. And right. it is a real pleasure to welcome our speakers from overseas. So a very warm welcome to Jose in Peru and also Ricardo and Mario in Argentina. Thank you all good so evening. much for joining us. Hi Hello, guys. everybody. Good, ev good, ev good evening. Thank you for tuning in and, uh, and taking the time to talk to us. I know it's the afternoon where, where you all are. Uh, as always, folks, ask as many questions as you like using the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Do feel free to put comments in the chat. We'll answer questions as much as we can uh, towards the end of the evening. Jose, I know you can't stay for questions after your talk as you're in, you're in very high demand today. You'll be leaving to take some clients out. So if any of you do have some questions specifically for Jose, just pop them to us anyway and uh, he can answer you by email. So without any yes, further please. ado, taking us to Chile is Tim. Over to Tim. you, Tim. Thank you, Sarah. Right. So um, I'm Tim Melling. I've been uh, leading for Nature Trek since the late 1990s, uh, 20 odd years now. Uh, I've led all over the world, including South America, and uh, it's uh, southern Chile that I'm uh, taking you today. And you've probably guessed by my opening slide that one of the target species that we want to see in uh, uh, southern Chile is puma. And uh, but we'll be coming to those uh, a bit later on. So the, the main place that we stay uh, is the uh, Torres del Paine, uh, Paine National Park, which is uh, absolutely spectacular. You'll be seeing a lot of these mountains as we go on. But uh, we usually uh, arrive in Punta Arenas and then we have to drive several hours to reach the uh, Torres del Paine National Park. So uh, and uh, the drive through the, um, uh, the habitat there uh, usually enables you to pick up a few interesting species on en route. Every time somebody stops something, we holler to, 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 to uh, um, slow down the uh, minibus and have a look. And there are things like uh, uh, Darwin's or lesser rears um, just by the side of the roadside, getting uh, really good close views of those. This is um, the smaller, slightly smaller of the two flightless rear species that uh, uh, occur in South America. Uh, the other ones further north in uh, Brazil, that's the, uh, the greater area. Um, Southern lapwing is another species that you see commonly down in the, uh, uh, the south there. Um, you can see it's curiously similar to the lapwing that we get in Britain, but uh, with a, a, a plain grey uh, hoodie on it. And uh, it's also got some real sharp spurs uh, on the leading edge of its forewing. I've watched them fighting, but it's really difficult to capture those in a, a, a photograph. 
Uh, upland geese, very, very common. Uh, great sexual dimorphism in these. That's the male on the right, the female on the left. And uh, you always see them in pairs, but they're by the roadside wherever you drive in, uh, in uh, southern South America. And uh, we pass uh, several lakes too. Um, lots of Chilean flamingos on, uh, on, on these lakes. Um, often quite distant. These were all taken by me from the car uh, traveling through. So it's not like um, in, a, in a, a zoo or a collection. In, uh, in in Britain, you know, you see them as proper wild flamingos doing what wild flamingos do. Uh, the um, uh, black neck swans also we uh, uh, usually stumble across those on the lakes there, and various species of ducks, uh, uh, including the uh, uh, yellow billed pintail and uh, things like chiloe widgeon as well uh, uh, there. But it's really the uh, Torres del Paine National Park that we're trying to get to, and this is the lake uh, uh, where we stay um, in the uh, in the national park. I took that on a very calm day. Unfortunately, the uh, the, the clouds were covering the mountains, so that wasn't quite as spectacular as it could have been. But uh, that's a uh, uh, that, that's a typical view of the of the lakeside there. Um, we have a drive around in the uh, in amongst the mountains and there's one uh, lake in particular that goes by the rather prosaic name Grey Lake uh, and here um, it, it's uh, you can see with the uh, uh, icebergs and things but in this uh, uh, sandy beach on the edge of Grey Lake, uh, that's where we saw our first evidence that there were pumas in the area. At this point, we still hadn't seen a puma, but uh, to see these huge great footsteps, uh, footprints going through the uh, sand showed that there had been one there not too long ago, so uh, our hopes were high. Uh, but before we leave Grey Lake, uh, what, what a, a terrible name for such a spectacular lake where a glacier comes off the back of the, uh, the mountain range and carves icebergs into an inland lake, uh, you know, it's almost like going to Windermere and seeing icebergs floating around in it. Really fabulous thing to see. Uh, in the uh, in, in the lakes and the slow flowing rivers, there's the biggest grebe in the world, the great grebe, Podiceps major. It's a uh, uh, it's even bigger than a great crested grebe, about a pound heavier uh, uh, on average uh, there. And there are some great uh, uh, waterfalls on the rivers there. And uh, where you get these uh, uh, really uh, fast moving water, that's a good place to see the torrent duck. Uh, that's a male torrent duck there. The uh, these only occur in the really fast moving moving rivers on the uh, of the Andes. That's the only place on the planet that you can see torrent ducks. <clears throat> and uh, a bit rarer, this is actually near threatened now. This is the spectacle duck. Um, and they, uh, the, the sexes are identical. They occur on slow moving rivers. Uh, the other name for them is bronze winged duck, but um, uh, because of the color of the speculum, the, the shiny bit on the back of the wing. But like uh, all ducks, it has iridescence. And, and when you see it from certain angles, it looks a, a coppery bronze color. But uh, from this angle where I took it, it looks rather magenta and uh, much prettier than the bronze color so uh, uh, but that's another bird that we usually see on the uh, uh, the, the rivers down in the south of uh, Chile and black-faced ibis is common uh, that's been split from the uh, uh, the, the northern uh, uh, the, the ibis that occurs in the, uh, uh, the the amazon area and the pantanal uh, lots of the birds down here have the name austral which means southern uh, australia is the southern land and austral just means southern and this is the austral thrush a relative of the american robin as you'll probably guess but uh, this one only occurs right in the the far south of the uh, of, of, of south america also on the falkland islands as well. Um, and the austral blackbird, which as you probably guessed by its uh, its uh, beak shape, but it isn't a blackbird at all. It's related to the, it's the icterids, it's the orioles and caciques and things like that. I liked its scientific name, Cureus Cureus, but Cureus is just the local name for it and that was incorporated into the uh, scientific name. And uh, because um, they were a bit later in, in giving English names, that they had to concoct English names. So very often you get three part names like this one, the tufted tit tyrant, and you even get the uh, uh, four part names uh, uh, there. Those are very common. Now, the thing about tufted tit tyrant, apart from being an absolutely excellent bird and looks very like a crested tit, is it's one of about a thousand birds that, that 
that um, uh, evolved out of the songbird line many many uh, years ago uh, really early on in the uh, in the evolution of the songbirds and they don't they have a completely different structure of the syrinx in the throat which is the bit that forms a song completely different they call these birds subossines there are only about a thousand species and many most of these are in south america and that includes uh, uh, yeah tufted tit tyrant but it's it's many south american birds that you might know like like Katingas and uh, mannequins and uh, uh, oven birds uh, and tyrant flycatchers as well. Uh, here's another one of them. Uh, this is the uh, uh, the Rufus tail plant cutter. I said you're going to be getting lots of these four part names. Uh, a fabulous bird, but really inappropriately named because it's Rufus almost everywhere apart from its tail. Yeah, it's called the Rufus tail plant cutter. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to give you too many scientific names, but where I think they're interesting, I'll put them in. It's Phytotoma rara. Now, Phytotoma means plant cutter uh, because it does eat leaves and buds and things like that, a bit like our bullfinch does. And rara, that does mean rare in Latin, and they aren't that common, but uh, th this one was apparently named because uh, the, the call it makes is uh, uh, rara, so it's onomatopoeic, so uh, Rufus Tail Plant Cutter. There are all sorts of little uh, lakes and things in the Torres del Paine National Park and uh, around there there's uh, interesting things to see like white tufted grebes. Uh, it's like, like a, a black and white version of the black neck grebe here. Uh, they're common on the, uh, the pools down there. And the Andean duck, um, it's been, it's currently split from ruddy duck, but some authorities lump them, but uh, always has the black head unlike the white faced uh, ruddy duck of Northern, uh, of North America. And uh, that's the only picture I managed to get of a plumbeous rail but it was uh, striding along the top like a tightrope water across the top of the rushes uh, on the edge of this and just down in the bottom left there is a, a red gartered coot uh, there's a, a number of species of coots that you get down there the uh, uh, south america is obviously the epicenter of coot evolution and grebes as well uh, so you get a lot a lot more species down there um, this is uh, looking high down on Lake Piho. That uh, island down there you can see is where our hotel is and we access it down that little wooden footbridge that you can see leading onto it and uh, this uh, lovely red uh, orange flower in the foreground goes by the name of Guanaco Splash. Um, I didn't ask about the origin of that, presumably it's got something to do with where the uh, 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 guanacos go, but the, it's a great source of, of uh, nectar, sugary uh, um, uh, fluid which birds need for their calories so you often see birds attracted to it and uh, here's the rufous collared sparrow which is uh, uh, it's common over much of uh, South America uh, very common down there uh, familiar you often see it around houses uh, when I was down there, I photographed this bird and I wasn't sure what it was. And I went to open up my Chilean book and I thought, oh, this will be really easy finding a grey bird with a bright yellow throat. And I homed in on the yellow throat and I went through every single species and could not find it anywhere. And uh, then I thought, hang on a minute, am I uh, doing something wrong here? Ignore the yellow throat. And of course, it was ended up, it was a plumbeous uh, Sierra finch. And the yellow throat was just the nectar because it had been feeding on the Guanaco splash uh, flowers and it had got some pollen on its throat and I thought that that was a, a feather feature which wasn't in the books there. Um, another Sierra finch is the grey hooded Sierra finch. Uh, they're called finches but these are actually tanagers which is another one of these subossine uh, uh, groups from uh, South America. Um, the scaly throated earth creeper as well. There are about uh, 10 species of earth creeper and I've put the scientific name in there because I think it's brilliant. Eupusurthia and those of you that know about scientific names will see that that's a concatenation of two um, familiar European birds. Eupupa is the name for a hoopoe and surthia is the name for a, um, a tree creeper and you can see so it's uh, basically a hoopoe tree creeper of the thickets. That's what dumetaria means. Uh, lots of interesting little things like this. Uh, the fire-eyed di diucon. Diucon is a local name for it, but its scientific name, pyrope, pyrope. Pyrope means fire-eyed, which is exactly what its English name is, and you can see the, the lovely red eye there. The turquoise in the background is the uh, 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 Lake Piho where we, we stay. It's a lovely turquoise colour when the light catches it. 
The, uh, uh, another one of these, uh, they, they're called oven birds because uh, some of the species build uh, uh, clay nests like a, an oven. And this is the thorn-tailed riadito. There's only two species of riadito, uh, and uh, this is the one that we get in southern Chile. Uh, riadito just is, uh, I'm told, is Spanish for little stripy thing. And you can see the thorn tails there. And I did take um, one more picture of it because it just looks so angry there looking straight at me with its, uh, its bill. It seems to have got a frowning mouth looking angrily at the uh, uh, at the camera Austral parakeet, uh, that's the uh, the most southerly uh, parrot on the planet, C occurs right the way down to the uh, uh, southern tip of uh, southern South America, but that's another species that we uh, often see in the Nothophagus uh, forest down there. And uh, dark-bellied dark synclodes, there's, there's uh, again about 10 to 15 species of synclodes in South America. Synclodes means dipper-like or resembling a dipper, and uh, they, they, they're not related at all to them because they they're oven birds, but they are, uh, they look like them and you often get them near water as well. So Synclus is the scientific name for a dipper. So Synclodes is uh, like a dipper. And uh, there's several species we see down there. I've just put a couple of them in there. It's called white winged because when it flies, there's a big white flash in its wing there. But uh, pumas are the thing that we want to see. The same species that they call cougars in North America and mountain lion, but uh, puma is the uh, South American name, so we'll go with that. Um, uh, so they're most active at dusk and dawn. So we always make sure that we're out when the uh, greatest activity is there. And um, we were uh, trying to see, uh, get as many sightings as we could. And when I was down there, we saw 19 different uh, pumas in the uh, uh, five or so days that we spent down there. Um, some of them were quite distant like this, but you can see there that is um, a mother with uh, three cubs uh, following her. So that was uh, four of the ones that we saw. Um, the, uh, but w when the uh, after the dawn and dusk uh, uh, hotspots for uh, puma, there's plenty of other things to see, including andy and condors. They're very, very common down there. Uh, that's a male with that great caruncle, the great shield on his head there. And uh, here's a female that lacks that, just got the, uh, the fluffy neck collar. Huge, great things, but uh, uh, again, a, a great iconic bird to see down there. So, uh, and uh, black-chested buzzard eagle as well. Uh, you just see these on roadside posts and things and feeding on uh, roadkill in the roads, but it's a huge thing. That's a, uh, a juvenile, by the way, but these things have got a two meter wingspan. They're as big as golden eagles, yet they're as common as buzzards down there. And uh, uh, southern crested caracara, uh, the caracaras, you, you've probably heard that uh, uh, when people have started studying the DNA of birds of prey, they found that falcons are completely unrelated to all the other birds of prey, like uh, eagles and hawks and uh, uh, stuff like that. Really, it's just convergent evolution that made them look the same. But caracaras are actually uh, uh, the same family as falcons. So they're this, uh, this uh, other group. And there's a, a close up of one of these uh, southern crested caracaras. This actually is the second heaviest falcon on the planet. Jure falcon is the only thing that can top it in weight, uh, a very, very big, substantial one. And much commoner and much smaller is the Chimango caracara. Uh, Chimango is uh, another local name for it, but you see these like uh, kestrels over the roadsides and often in largish numbers as well. Uh, here's just a, uh, a, a typical bridge that we have to drive across. No, I'm joking. The, the, the new bridge was near the side. That was just an old rickety bridge that had been left in its uh, in place there. And I just thought it made quite a nice photograph and it shows you what the habitat's like. So I mentioned guanaco splash, the flower earlier. Uh, guanacos are very, very common all over the Torres del Paine National Park. And um, uh, they're a, a, a wild relative of uh, llama. In fact, the scientific name is llama guanaki, guanaco. Um, and uh, you see great flocks of them feeding on the, uh, uh, on the grasslands around uh, there. Now, when they've got their heads down and feeding like this, you know that there's no danger about their very, very relaxed and chilled uh, and uh, that's what they do and when they're really relaxed and chilled sometimes they do other interesting things like have a dust bath uh, right by the side of the road here uh, watch this one rolling over like a dog does and um, but when they've all got their heads up and they're all looking in the same direction with their ears forward like that 
that is usually indication that there's a predator about and they make a little squeaking noise that they only ever make when there is a puma about so you know if you hear that noise you've got to scour the hillside looking for a puma and they're often not as easy as you might think to spot you think a great big cat but they're a sandy colored cat and uh, the, the uh, and they often stay to the shadows and the bushes and and the ground uh, the habitat is very sandy colored so um they can be difficult to spot but all these were taken you know just from the roadside uh, as we were uh, uh, driving around looking for uh, pumas uh, one time during the middle of the day, we stopped by a beautiful lake with reflections of the mountains there. And we were just having a look and seeing what birds were on there. And there was some uh, flying steamer ducks um, uh, uh, there. And there was the silvery grebes, uh, a big flock of those. And then we saw two guanacos herring past, uh, uh, chasing each other uh, like mad. I thought, oh, what's going on there? Is it two rival males? And then just a couple of seconds later, this puma just came running straight past them at the same um, uh, on the same trajectory uh, and uh, it, it was losing ground on them all the time but it carried on going and that's what made me think it was probably a young puma that hasn't realized that you don't uh, chase guanacos over a large distance because they'll just gain ground on you they're uh, much faster but the the, the uh, pumas are faster in, in a, a short little dash so what pumas usually do is they hunt stealthily they creep using the bushes just like this uh, you know not making a Sound, just gradually moving through and then when, if they can get within 20 meters of a guanaco without being spotted they um, they're off but there's they're usually in big herds and they're all on the lookout all the time for these things a few other birds that you see around there, the long-billed meadow lark. Uh, you've probably seen the yellow and black meadow larks that you get in uh, North America. Well, this is the uh, long-billed one, which is bright scarlet and uh, black uh, instead, a very handsome bird there. And uh, a, another, a true falcon that you get down there. This is the American kestrel. They just caught a lizard. I don't know what kind of lizard it was. I tried to find out, but uh, uh, drew a blank uh, there. But uh, um, this one was one we just found a, a puma that was stored and then it, it noticed us and it's just making eye contact with a wild uh, uh, cat like this it stopped what it was doing and just stared straight back at us uh, you know it still sends shivers down my spine when I see a, uh, a, 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 a big puma like this and uh, this was just two youngsters whilst the mother had gone off hunting for a guanaco and uh, they were just mucking about and playing you can see one there they've been climbing over each other and one's got its tail wrapped around the other one's neck but uh, it's really good and we were seeing pumas every single day. Um, we saw a few other mammals as well. This is the Patagonian hognose skunk and uh, this is the uh, culpeo, the, uh, uh, the, the South American red fox, and uh, this is the chilla or South American grey fox, a slightly smaller one, but uh, we saw all of these. But it's the, uh, uh, the pumas that are the stars of the show. Um, when I told uh, a friend of mine who does a lot of astrophotography that I was going down to Patagonia, he said uh, he was so envious and said, oh, they have brilliant uh, Milky Ways down in the Southern Hemisphere, far better than you ever see in Britain, um, you know, and he gave me a crash course on what to do. And I'd never photographed the night sky before, but I listened to his lessons. And uh, so at night, uh, I went out and pointed the camera. And uh, these were these were the first um, efforts I ever managed. But getting the spectacular snow covered peaks in the background with a really bright Milky Way going over in Lake Pio in the foreground there. And uh, there's another one as well with the uh, Milky Way going across the sky but it really is brighter than I've ever seen the Milky Way uh, in this country and there's the moon setting. So um, uh, I mentioned that we uh, we we set off and we um, uh, we arrive and we set off from Punta Arenas, which is on the coast. And so it's often a good place to pick up a few more birds. I showed you the uh, flying steamer duck earlier, and these are the very similar but flight less steamer ducks that you get at the coast there. And uh, uh, blue-eyed shag that was another common bird, and uh, rock shag as well. Good numbers of those at Punta Arenas. Magellanic oyster catchers, um, and also a few seabirds that. I I managed to see um, uh, southern fulmers, which surprised me because in Antarctica we usually only see those when they're really far south, and Punta Arenas is quite far north and tucked in. And uh, this as well, southern giant petrel, which uh, amazed me. This was actually taken from the beach at Punta Arenas. It wasn't taken on an Antarctic trip where the ten a penny. This was just off the, uh, the beach there. 
So uh, another great bird to see. And I'm gonna leave you with a sunset. Actually, this is a sunrise, but it looks like a sunset. And there's a puma uh, at sunrise. There's two pumas actually there, if you look very carefully, and uh, uh, with a sky background. This was before I was taking raw images, so I couldn't process it to bring up the uh, any detail in the puma's face. So you'll have to make do with silhouettes, but I thought it was quite a dramatic shot to finish on. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Fantastic talk, Tim. I love that final shot that you've got there. Just, just stunning. I don't think you needed to lift the shadows on it. It's, uh, it says <laughs> it all how it is. And um, those shots of the Milky Way were just absolutely outstanding. Really incredible. Well done. Thank you. Paul, over to you now. Sorry, folks, I'm whispering away to myself, so forgetting I, I've, I've muted myself. So one second, I'll just quickly share my screen and I'll be with you. Right, almost there. Okay, right. Well, hey, thank you very much, Tim. That's a great um, start to the evening. Um, my name's Paul Stanbury. Um, I'm here in the midst of the, of the Nature Trek office um, and um, I've been working for Nature Trek now for about 26 years. Um, I'm ops, ops manager. I look after uh, a, a range of, of different tours, including um, our tours to um, Argentina and Chile. Um, and I'm going to talk this evening, um, as the first slide suggests, on Northern Argentina. Um, um, from the Andes to I Iguazu Falls, um, and then take you to some of the, the highlights of that region and show you some of the, of the wildlife as well. And um, then I should mention that, that Ricardo, who is out in Argentina at this very moment, he lives in, in Salta, um, will be taking us down to, the, down to the south of the country. But as I mentioned, I'm going to focus my talk on the north, uh, but all trips to Argentina start with uh, a flight into, into the capital, into Buenos Aires. And Argentina is an amazing country. It's 3,700 kilometers from north to south, 1,400 kilometers from, from east to west. That's the equivalent of the UK stretching from the Shetlands all the way down to the Canary Islands. As you can imagine, there are a few countries in the world that can boast such a variety of, of scenery and topography and habitats and um, the most amazing uh, variety of, of wildlife as well. So say we fly into Buenos Aires and then from Buenos Aires, we fly out to um, our, our um, other sites. And even Buenos Aires is a fantastic uh, city actually for, for wildlife. There's a, there's a, a, a lovely reserve called Costanera Sur uh, on the edge of the, edge of the city. Um, fabulous for birds, great introduction to uh, to South American bird life. But the main sites I'm going to talk about um, tonight are, are listed on this on this map here. So we've got um, Salta and the Andes up in the, the, the top left of the map and Salta's right on the on the very edge of the spectacular Andes mountains which run north south along the um, the west coast of, uh, of South America. Then we've got um, Marge Quita, uh, Lake, the uh, largest saltwater lake in South America, another fabulous wildlife destination. The Ibera wetlands, um, almost like, a, like a, a, mini, a mini Pantanal. And you can't really visit northern, the northern Argentina region without a trip to I I Iguazu Falls. I'm going to start, though, up in the, up in the Andes. Um, and uh, we run uh, a range of Argentina tours that include time in this spectacular area of the country. We have a, a short birding tour, 10 day birding tour that takes you from Salta up into the Andes and back again. We have another tour which combines the Andes with Iguazu. Um, and we're gonna be developing a, a, a range of, of, of new itineraries um, over, the, over the, the coming uh, months and years. But Salta is a, a great place to start your, your, your trip. So you're right at the foot of the Andes here, um, and it offers easy access to a range of, of, of different habitats from the Yungus cloud forest up to the dizzying heights of the, of, of the Antiplano, all, all within easy, easy reach. 
Um, and on our tours, we visit the youngest cloud forest. We also go up to the Altiplano uh, lakes as well. And the Andes, it's the longest mountain chain um, in the world, um, stretching all the way from Tierra del Fuego up into, up into Colombia and then Venezuela and up actually up into Central uh, America as well. Spectacular scenery, as well as some fabulous um, wildlife. Um, Salta itself so it lies in the, um, the, the cloud forest zone um, and we'll take you up into the cloud forest on, on all of the trips. You start up in the cloud forest and then we work higher up into the mountains as the, as the tour uh, uh, proceeds. These are lovely moss draped cloud forests home to such birds as Syaka tanager, white belly hummingbird, brown cap, red star, bridges, guan, and a whole range of, of other birds as well. It's a really nice um, hotel um, that, that we, we stay in here. Um, so on the edge of the of the Yungus uh, cloud forest, um, you can sit out on out on the balcony, um, have a have a cool drink, look out over the forest and see some some, some wonderful birds. And they've even got some uh, interpretation boards just outside so you can identify uh, what's going to fly past and very comfortable uh, accommodation uh, as well. And after we've explored the, the Yungus uh, for a couple of days, we will head higher up into the Andes. Um, and as you, as you climb up in height, of course, the habitat uh, changes. Um, and as the habitat changes, the, the, the bird life changes as well. Um, and there's a wonderful range of, of different species that, that you'll see on this trip, um, so different ones as you gradually gain height over the, over the days. Um, here we have the, uh, the, 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 the burrowing parrot, um, um, uh, quite a, a large parrot, parakeet um, that lives uh, quite high up um, in the Andes. Tim showed you the, um, the, the torrent ducks um, down, in, um, down in southern Chile, where of course they occur up in, up in the Argentinian Andes as well. Um, and they, they're incredible swimmers and they fight against these um, amazingly fast um, 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 turbid streams. In fact, you can see, I've seen torrent duck up in Ecuador. It's a bird that, given the right habitat, um, lives from um, Tierra del Fuego all the way up into, um, into northern South America. But beautiful birds, the male here with the black and white striped head and the female um, next to um, wing stretching alongside. As we climb, climb higher, habitats change again, and you enter um, the mid-elevation cacti forests of places like Los Cardonos National Park. Um, as you would imagine, the scenery, the landscapes here, just spectacular, lots of wonderful photographic opportunities. The bird life again, you know, again, as with the torrent duck, condors occur from, from Patagonia all the way north up into, up into Colombia. And, and they're a commonly seen bird as you, as you climb higher up into, um, up into the Andes. Uh, as well as the condors, there's lots of other species to look out for. Um, here we have the Andean uh, flicker, uh, which are often seen around on the rocks. They look, they, they act very much like our, our green woodpeckers over here and uh, foraging around on the ground looking for, looking for ants and, 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 and other insects. But we've got various other species up here to, to um, a variety of different siskins, Sierra finches. Um, there are um, miners, castaneros, um, another range of those those oven birds that uh, Tim mentioned in uh, during during his his talk. But as well as the brown, there are some spectacular species to enjoy as well. Um, and this is the wonderful little red-tailed comet um, hummingbird, which it, which lives high up um, in the Andes. A beautiful, beautiful bird. Maybe the the, um, the sun, the light catches it just in the right way. As you can see on this photograph, the tail is a wonderful gold colour, and the back is crimson, um, iridescent crimson, scarlet. But they're quite common actually up in up in this, the higher uh, mid elevation uh, range. As is another bird that again occurs down in um, in, in Chile, the uh, beautiful long tailed meadow lark with its uh, bright scarlet throat and breast. And we climb gradually um, higher and higher. We give you time, of course, to acclimatize to the, to the altitude. 
Um, the scenery gets uh, more and more spectacular. Um, there's less and less vegetation as you, as you climb up and you're getting up into the high Altiplano and um, Puna um, habitats. Um, up here, we start to see the guanaco. Um, that again, so a lot of these species occur from Patagonia all the way north. But as you go further north, and of course the climate gets uh, warmer, the the um, guanaco live up at higher higher elevations. Um, they're, they're in very similar habitat to that that Tim showed you down in um, Torres del Paine. But we also hope to see the, um, the, the, the cousin of the, the guanaco, the beautiful vicuña, um, a very um, delicate creature, um, graceful thin neck, and they tend to live at a little bit higher altitude um, than, the, than the guanaco, and they're, they're commonly seen up in the, up in the higher Andes um, and in northern Argentina. So we're going to be climbing up to a pretty dizzying altitude, really. You can get up to over 16,000 feet. This is, um, or fuck, which is in, in new money, four, about 4,800 metres. This is the Abradal Ake uh, Pass, with volcanoes in the distance there. But even up here, you're still seeing an interesting um, variety of, of, of bird life, a very hardy bird life that can survive this high, high altitude in some pretty extreme conditions. So we're going to be looking for birds like gray, gray bellied seed snipe, um, a, um, a, 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 a type of wader um, that occurs in the high um, Andes. There's a variety of different seed snipe species that occur north south uh, through the Andes. The, the gray bellied is one of the, the common ones to look out for up in northern Argentina. And out on the Puna Steppe, one of my absolute favorites, um, the, the, the beautiful tawny throated dotterel. Um, these birds occur like, oh, a similar sort of habitat really to the dotterel we get over here up in, up in Scotland. They occur up in the high um, windswept um, Puna Altiplano and they occur around in little, little flocks. Absolutely beautiful, gorgeous birds. Um, and on several tours we'll get far uh, north up near the, the border with Chile and, and Bolivia to Lake Pozuelos, um, it's a beautiful Altiplano Lake that sits at 3,600 metres, so that's about 12,000 feet um, above sea level, surrounded by the most spectacular um, Altiplano landscape. It was designated a national park in 1981, and it's the home of some very special birds, including this one here, the, the Puna uh, Flamingo, also known as James's uh, Flamingo. But as well as the Puna Flamingos, we'll be looking for um, Andean avocets, and there are silvery greaves up here. There are uh, the rare giant coot, various wintering um, wading birds from North America, such as beds and pectoral sandpiper um, and Wilson's phalarope. So really, even though you're up this high altitude in a pretty extreme environment, the bird life is, is incredibly um, diverse. Um, around the lake um, and in other sites near, nearby, we will we will look for this most amazing little bird, probably one of the most sought after um, birds in the whole of South America, the, the diadem sandpiper plover. And they occur on the high altitude, um, boggy, um, wet flushes that occur in, um, up, up here. They're quite difficult to see. There's a couple of sites which um, our guides know of and we hope to find them for you. There are other sites um, to look for them in, in, in Chile as well. But yeah, an absolute key and an iconic bird, iconic wader of the of the high Andes. Um, and then from from the, the high Andes, we, take, we gradually make our way back down again um, to Salta, having seen a wide range of altitudes and landscapes and, and scenery too. But after you've explored the, um, the, the Andes, then there are, there are a lot of other interesting sites to explore in the region as well. We can go down to uh, Marjikita um, Lagoon, we fly into Cordoba, probably flying from Salta to Buenos Aires, and then across to Cordoba. Um, and from there, it's only two or three hours up to, up to Marjikita Lagoon. And this is the, say, the largest salt lake in the whole of South America, measuring 70 kilometers by 40 kilometers. And it's Argentina's newest national park. It's incredibly important, in particular for its, for its bird life and for its uh, flamingos and 
and wintering um, wading birds. It was also the focus of the 2018 bird fair which raised over £322,000 for the continual protection and the designate that helped in the um, formulating of the management plan and the, the designation of the reserve as a national park. And during our time in our Chiquita, we always place ourselves along the southern edge of the lake um, at a place called uh, Miramar. Um, and uh, the commonest flamingo here is the, is the Chilean uh, flamingo. But in the non-breeding season, they also do get a few Puna flamingos um, uh, and Andean flamingos um, as well. We'll take you out on a boat trip to look at the, at the flocks of flamingos out on the lake. Around the lake shore itself, there are loads of, of waders. The lake, lake shore is absolutely crowded with, um, with, wading, with wading birds. Um, this is one of the most important wintering grounds for Wilson's phalaropes um, anywhere in South America. In fact, up to 500,000 or so half a million Wilson's phalaropes winter here um, some years. Most of them tend to winter on the northern edge of the lake. Um, but there are always some along along the southern edge um, as well. And if you if you visit uh, at the end of our winter in February March time, then you should hopefully see them in this wonderful breeding plumage. And this is a female bird, because the phalaropes, the females that are brighter than the males, and the, and the females display to the males, and, and it's the males that incubate the, the eggs and rear the young. Out on the lake, there's some other spectacular birds to look for. The amazing great grebe, uh, one of my uh, absolute favourites. And there's some also smaller little white tufted grebes as well, look a little bit like the, uh, uh, the black necked grebes of, um, of, of Europe. And there are plenty of water birds to enjoy, a lot of variety of different coots and swans and, and ducks and, 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 and other species as well. It's a very, very diverse area. Around the edge of, uh, of the lake, there's a, a mix of, of different habitats, some agricultural areas, some dry Chaco style um, 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 woodland um, scrub. And burrowing owl is, is, is a common bird really throughout this northern um, Argentinian region, especially where you've got uh, agriculture and, and flat land. And out in the woodland, we'll be looking for some interesting um, land birds and hopefully birds such, such as this uh, scimitar bailed uh, wood creeper. There's a very different habitat here to the Andes and a very different uh, range of, of species um, to look out for. Um, and moving on, we move up to uh, the Ibra uh, wetlands. This is a, a, almost a mini Pantanal, um, very similar habitat, similar wetland bird life. In fact, in fact, it even has jaguars now. Uh, jaguars were reintroduced into the Ibra wetlands very recently after an absence of 70 years. What do you not? We'd be very lucky to see a jaguar uh, the, uh, at the moment, but um, the, the bird life and the other wildlife here really is quite uh, quite spectacular. The wetlands, the, the reserve protects a mix of grasslands, cattle ranches, wetlands. They will say it's teeming with wildlife, including lots of lots of capybara, lots of uh, wetland birds. We've got roseate spoonbill here. Um, it's one of a wide variety of, of wetland birds you're likely to see. The lesser rear uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in the drier areas around the edge of the wetlands. Some wonderful little birds as well, little passerines, such as the white um, Mon monhita, a beautiful, beautiful little bird uh, that occurs in, in, in the scrubby woodland around the edge of the, the, the wetlands. But for the bird, for the very keen bird, there's one particular species to see here. And this is the best place to see this particular bird probably anywhere in, in the whole of South America. And this is the very aptly named strange tailed tyrant. It's a type of tyrant flycatcher that lives out in the grasslands of the Ebert wetlands. And they have this bizarre, uh, as their name would suggest, tail. Um, and when they're flying, it's incredible things. It's, it's just a, a um, very, very odd bird, very, very rare localized, but, but quite, but not difficult to see um, in the, in the Ebra wetlands. Um, and if you explore Ebra, in fact, really, if you explore anywhere in Northern Argentina, um, you really have to finish your trip with a, with a couple of nights at the spectacular uh, Iguazu Falls. Um, it's not that far from Iber, actually. It's only a, a, a few hours drive. Um, and this is in the province of Misiones. And it sits on the border between Argentina and Brazil. And there's spectacular 275 different individual cascades, waterfalls um, here. And it's surrounded by very lush um, forest. 
Um, again, very different habitat to, to what you would have seen either in, um, um, in the Andes or in Ibra or, um, or, or like um, Marjikita and a very different variety of bird life as well. You can see in this photograph here, lots of, lots of little black dots wheeling around in the sky. Well, these are the, the great dusky swifts that you actually hear about to see in all the David Attenborough programs, not only <clears throat> wheeling about above you, but plunging through the waterfall um, to, to nest and roost um, inside on the rock faces uh, behind the great torrents of water. And this, so this photograph here was taken, I took this, with a, with a standard camera, with a standard lens. And you can see these amazing birds roosting and sitting on the side of the, of the cliff face as the water plunges down beside them, behind them. And we'll also visit the, the very famous Devil's Throat. <coughs> which I've sort of got at the moment, so excuse me. <coughs> um, in the here, um, this is one of, this is the largest of the, of the, of the falls in Iguazu, where there's over 2 million litres of water pour over the falls every single second. So it's an absolutely spectacular place um, to visit. But as well as seeing the falls, then hey, we'll, we'll explore the, the lush forests as well, looking for the, the bird life. Taco toucans are, are, are common here, actually often seen in the, in, in the grounds of the falls themselves, uh, feeding in the trees around the uh, information centre and little cafes. In the forest, we'll be looking for the beautiful swallow-tailed mannequin, and hopefully even birds such as the, the, the equally beautiful uh, blonde-crested woodpecker. And an interesting range of, of, of butterflies, insects, reptiles, and, and other things. This is just a great place to, to end your, your, your stay in, in, in Argentina. Spectacular scenery, some really nice wildlife as well. And as you imagine, some very, very good uh, hotels. So <coughs> before my voice finally packs up, <coughs> excuse me, um, I, will, I will end it there and say thank you very much. Um, for listening. Um, if you've got any questions at all on, on Argentina or Northern Argentina, please let me know. I think we're going to take a, a, a break now. Um, and then after the break, Ricardo's going to continue with um, a trip around Southern Argentina. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul.
Okay, folks, welcome back. Uh, oh, I'm pleased you appro approve of the choice of music, Carol. Thank you. 
and uh, apologies for the the slight difficulty getting the uh, the music to share there every time I muted myself the uh, the music stopped playing so it took me uh, four or five attempts but I'm glad we got there at the end right so we've uh, covered northern Argentina with uh, Paul and we're now going to be moving to southern Argentina with Ricardo so I'm just going to um, allow Ricardo to uh, start his video Ricardo, if you just, yeah, perfect, that's great. And Ricardo, you're joined by Mario as well, who has been, uh, you've both been working with Nature Trek for, for many, many years since the start of Nature Trek, haven't you? So please just introduce yourselves and, and take us away with your lovely presentation. And thank you so much for joining us from Argentina this evening. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. And uh, good evening, you all. Uh, yes, um, I am Ricardo by my side, my colleague, Mario. Hello, everybody. And uh, yes, it is true, uh, we, we have been working uh, with, uh, as a guide for Nature Trek from the beginning, some 35, 36 years ago. And uh, I said, uh, good evening, although it is a bit earlier here in Argentina. We are sitting in our office here in Salta. Salta is that uh, small province in the northwest of the country that uh, Paul has been telling you about. And um, yes, it is a bit earlier, I said, so um, not adequate for a glass of wine, I am afraid. It's a bit too early. <laughs> I'm sure many well, people here sitting watching are uh, having a glass <laughs> of wine, Ricardo, on your behalf. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, enjoy that. Very good. <laughs> but it's a good time for our mate. <laughs> oh, yes, oh. that's this, this is the mate. This is the other official drink in Argentina. We, we, we drink mate with that gourd and the pipe. So <clears throat> that's something typical. Perfect. Um, well, cheers. <laughs> uh, right, let me get, please, let me get into the uh, Southern Argentina tour. And I will uh, share the screen with you. This is, no. Here we are. Although, can you see the um, yeah. presentation now? Yeah, that's perfect, Ricardo. Very good. Okay. So this, this, this is uh, the uh, map of Patagonia. And uh, as we have been seeing, this is Buenos Aires, located uh, a bit farther north. And this is the entrance gate to Argentina. The flights arrive in Buenos Aires. On the first day, when we arrive to Buenos Aires, there will be time in the afternoon for, uh, for a visit to the Costanera Sur Reserve. That is the reserve that uh, you have had information as well from, from Paul. Uh, it is really interesting uh, place with uh, wetlands uh, by the side of La Plata River. And uh, when we visit that place in one afternoon, uh, we see, we usually see 60, 70 species of birds there, including some of the very, uh, I would say, emblematic species, such as the Rufus Hornero, our national bird, and uh, the spectacular uh, uh, Chaja, Southern Screamer. Chaja is our, our common name in, in Argentina, onomatopoeic. Um, but, um, on the, uh, this, this is just to spend the afternoon in Buenos Aires. On the next day, we take an early flight to the south. We fly to Trelew. I cannot, I, do, I cannot uh, point out the places here in the map for some reason, but Trelew is near Valdez Peninsula and it is mentioned in the map. Can you follow me? Is it something that you can see there in the map? Trelew. No, I can't see your cursor. 
I'm afraid, mm -hmm. Ricardo. But um, oh, we we can point. We can see it though. It is above, just above the eye of Patagonia. On the That's right. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, just to the south of the Valdez Peninsula, and uh, and uh, we fly to Trelew, and then we get into the famous Valdez Peninsula. Uh, I will show you. Oh, well, we we say Puerto Madryn because it is the most important town in this area. However, here we are. This this is Trelew. And uh, just after arriving, uh, arrival in Trello, we will drive by coach to Puerto Madryn. And uh, uh, from Puerto Madryn, we proceed uh, now driving to the east uh, in order to reach Puerto Pirámides here, right at the entrance of the Valdez Peninsula. These roads, they are uh, rather uh, easy driving. Uh, most of them are paved, but the last section here arriving to Puerto Pirámides is, is unpaved road. And all the roads that we will be driving in the next days in, in Valdez Peninsula, they are gravel roads. Um, so uh, in Puerto Pirámides, we will stay at a nice lodge overlooking the bay here. Um, first of all, let me show you. Well, here in this uh, map, um, you will find a few details, information on the different fauna that we have in, in, in Valdez Peninsula. Southern right ways, it says June 15th, to December, mid-December. That is true. Uh, Southern right whales can be seen during that uh, time of period. And we actually plan to make uh, a boat ride to see the whales. Then Magellanic penguins uh, from mid-September to mid-April. Orcas are, are in the area all year round. Although we can say that the best uh, part of the year are October and November to see them in Caleta Valdez. Caleta Valdez is here at the edge of the Valdez Peninsula on the eastern coast. And uh, then after that date, March and April are the best months to see them in Punta Norte, a bit farther north of Caleta Valdez, um, Punta Norte. Right, then of course, southern elephant seals, sea lions, they are all year round, all along the coast, as we will see a few photos. Dolphins, uh, only in the, in the summertime, in mid-December to April, and the rest of the, uh, of the fauna, including maras, foxes, armadillos, and so on, all year round. So uh, we will be here right in the time to visit the best parts of Valdez Peninsula, including the Gulf of Nuevo waters to see the whales. <clears throat> this is at the entrance, this place is Isla de los Pájaros, the bird island. It is located at the entrance of the Valdez Peninsula. What we do is drive with the coach to the place, get down there, uh, walk along the uh, paths that are very well designed. And uh, then we reach the coast. In some areas, we can actually walk to the edge of the water and uh, look for birds in that area. Then we get, yes, I told you about Puerto Pirámides. This is a nice photo of the small village of Puerto Pirámides. And that building with the green roofs, that is the ACA hotel where we normally stay. Very well located. And uh, what we are seeing here is the bay of the Gulf of Nuevo waters. These are the, 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 the waters where we see the, the whales in a special boat ride. Uh -huh. Well, these photos are showing us the, uh, the boat, the boat. We get into one of these boats to go and see the, 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 the southern right whales. And this thing, uh, tractor thing here on the right hand side, that is the, uh, 
the vehicle uh, that they used to pull the water from the water, out from the water, and then put it back once the people is uh, already uh, comfortable sitting inside. This, this <laughs> it is a rather interesting operation. And uh, when we have uh, high tide and we have some waves coming in, uh, this um, uh, tractor thing, it, it gets all covered by the water. So call it the yellow submarine or, or something like that. Um, but, but it is quite a, a, a very safe and brilliant operation, very practical. Here we are uh, with uh, some of the typical uh, views that we can have of the southern right whales in the Gulf of Nuevo waters. Yes, some of these whales get really close just to the border of the boat. So we see them from very close distance another magnificent tail. They, they call it tail flagging. They have different names for the behavior. This is a hippo here in the waters. No, hold on. This is a southern right whale head. <laughs> and uh, yes, you uh, here really you can almost touch the head of these whales that they get very close to the boat. And uh, uh, let me show you uh, a few uh, uh, pictures of uh, different uh, typical fauna of the peninsula. First of all, I would like to mention that uh, most of these pictures in the Valdez Peninsula, they belong to uh, our nature track guide, local guide, and our representative in Valdez Peninsula, Carol Mackey. Um, and Carol has been organizing all this section of the photos. Thank you, Carol. This is Darwin's Rhea or Lesser Rhea. Well, you have already seen Lesser Rhea in the photos by Tim. And uh, uh, why it is called Darwin or Lesser? Because it, they say, some authors will say that uh, there are two different species. The one in the Northwest, lesser, and the one in the south, in Patagonia, it is Darwin's, it should be Darwin's. But uh, nowadays, they are considered different races. So, lesser Rhea. And a very nice photo of the Chilean flamingos, just by the side of the, of the uh, sea. Here we have the Guanacos, again, as you can see, and uh, as, as, as Paul has been telling us the, the guanaco is widespread all the way from uh, Tierra del Fuego in the south and uh, uh, using the Patagonian steppe all the way up to the Valdez Peninsula and following the Andes change all the way up to the northwest of the country. Guanaco is one of the four species of camelids in South America. Uh, camelids, when I say camelids, it is, uh, we are talking about the uh, family of, of the camels, really. And these are South American camelids. You have already seen the vicuña in the northern Argentina too. Um, and the guanaco is, is easy to tell apart by this dark, grayish dark face from the vicuña. Vicuña is all pale. And uh, now we have a Patagonian gray fox on the left. There is a Patagonian cavy here on the right. Uh, Caveys are rodents. Well, I have heard some people calling them cavies, the pronunciation. Please uh, excuse me if I am not clear. Um, I say cavy. And uh, these Patagonian caves are rodents and they will share family with another, yet another, this Mara. Mara, this, this is a very typical um, mammal in Patagonia. And you, we see them here in Valdez Peninsula. The Mara is a rodent, is in the same family of the quiz, of the, uh, uh, of the lesser cavy. And um, uh, they, they look like a hare, but they are not related. 
to hairs. They are not in the, in the family of hairs. They have a plump body, those uh, thin legs, large head. And when they uh, run away, it, it's interesting to see that because they jump in the four legs. At the same time, they, they really go like jumping uh, all along. And uh, this is Patagonian Mara. Right, Mario is telling me to go farther on. <laughs> time is running. What we have here is Barawinal here on the left and uh, a tarantula, something that we normally see. That is on the right of the tarantula, there is a elegant crested tinamo with a, with a long crest that is competing with the, with the patch of grass behind. Very beautiful and common, yes. Then on the, uh, on the left again, a blackish oyster catcher, the burrowing parrots perching on the bush, a lizard, that is Patagonian lizard in the genus Lyolemus. This is getting into the real uh, important fauna along the coast. Elephant, southern elephant seals. The females are much smaller, one third of the male, and they do not have the the, the typical proboscis, the typical thing that the males have uh, that has earned their name of elephants. And um, this is Caleta Valdez. I wanted to show you a bit of the, of the shoreline in, the, in Valdez Peninsula. Caleta Valdez is really spectacular. You get to the, to the border and uh, with the binoculars, we see uh, lots of birds and we, we see the elephant seal colonies and, and, and uh, sea lions colonies, as well as a few penguins nesting. Here we are in Punta Norte. Punta Norte is uh, the North Point. Uh, this is the place where the orcas come to uh, sometimes to, to prey on, uh, on sea lions, and you see them in the uh, on the right hand side trying to catch uh, these sea lions. This is the thing that we see on the BBC uh, film when they beach themselves. The orcas beach themselves to catch to grab a, a sea lion in the colony. That is the, the thing that we see during March, April, not during October, November. That is a different place where we see the orcas. And uh, again, here, more pictures of the orcas with the explanation about the two seasons, October, November in Caleta Valdez, March, April in Punta Norte. Here, well, once we left, we leave from uh, Valdez Peninsula, we return to Trelew. And from Trelew, we take two nights in a nice hotel in Trelew. And from there, we will drive to Punta Tombo, the Magellanic penguin colony where, yes, more than 200,000 nesting pairs are there. Spectacular views of that penguin colony. Uh, once again, we have very well-designed uh, paths where we walk. And uh, yes, we, we will see Guanacos also near when we have ended this uh, visit to the Punta Tombo Magellanic Penguin Colony, we will visit the Chubut River Valley that is cultivated. And uh, this is the place where the Welsh immigrants um, established in the 19th century. Um, the um, Welsh traditions persist more than 6,000 people still speaking Welsh rather than in Spanish. We will indulge ourselves with some uh, cup of tea and uh, some Welsh cakes. Wonderful place to spend a couple of hours. And uh, well, we, see good, we say goodbye to the Peninsula Valdez area. We will take a flight to the next uh, de destination. This is El Calafate. El Calafate is a small town here 
on the um, on the southern portion of Santa Cruz province and on the western section near the Andes range. Here in El Calafate, we will spend three nights, three days. On the first day, we will visit, of course, Lago Argentino, and we will look for the Magellanic plover, as well as many other birds in the area. But uh, particularly Magellanic plover is one of the main attractions here. And we will see photos of that later. <clears throat> On the second day, we will go and visit the famous Moreno Glacier. The Perito Moreno Glacier is this spectacular uh, place uh, coming down. This is a river of ice, the water coming down from the, from the Patagonian ice cap. Fantastic. And of course, there, there, there is a several outlook points that we will walk and visit in the area. Another nice pictures of the uh, Moreno Glacier here, different angles of views. We can spend really uh, the full day in this area, enjoying all these spectacle and looking for birds. Let me get back into the map and uh, because I wanted to show you where is the Perito Moreno Glacier. I can't, uh, here is my pointer. This is Glacier Perito Moreno, right at the edge of the Andes, as we were saying. Next destination is on the third day. We will go into the Patagonian steppe again to La Leona River. La Leona River is to the north and east of Lago Argentino. And this is the place where we will see many other um, typical birds of the Patagonian steppe, such as chocolate vented tyrant. Uh, they see the snipes, both of them, gray breasted and least seed snipe. Uh, we will be looking for all of them. And particularly, we plan to go um, from La Leona, we will, which means the lioness, we will try our luck with Lago Bielma. We will drive along the road 21 and get more or less to this place where we will check the waters of the lake and the nature track groups have seen here the famous hooded grieve in the past. Never assured, of course, this is not the, the, the best place to look for it because it is far from here, but uh, sometimes we see a hooded grieve in Lago Vierma. One thing for sure, we will have wonderful, wonderful views of the, of the mountains that are a bit farther north and to the west, Cerro Torre and Cerro Fitzroy. Fitzroy Mount and Torre Mounts are really I would say emblems of the Patagonia and uh, we will have uh, wonderful views of them, although from a long distance, but really fantastic with the Lago Le Biedma Lake in front. Right, from, uh, from uh, I will run out, out of time. Oh, I'm sorry, this is Ushuaia. From here, we fly to Ushuaia, and uh, in Ushuaia, we will visit the Tierra del Fuego National Park, where uh, we will find ourselves immersed in the Patagonian forest. A couple of birds from uh, the Patagonian forest, Magellanic woodpecker, and uh, of course, we have plenty of photos of this place, but to be honest, uh, we will have to wait for another occasion. Um, many, many photos of these birds. At the end of this tour, we offer this Pampas extension, which is in Buenos Aires province. Pampas extension is, it's, it's grasslands, uh, endless grasslands uh, with uh, lots of wetlands, and uh, this is the place where we see Great Aria, giant wood rail here on the right, loads of new birds for us. And of course, 
perhaps this is the best mammal of the trip, the uh, Argentinian beef, Argentinian, <laughs> Argentinian barbecue. So thank you very much. And sorry for the delay. This is the end of the presentation here. Thank you so much, Ricardo and uh, Mario as well. That was a whirlwind tour through uh, all of the bird life there, but uh, fantastic to see all of that. And folks, if you have any further questions, do just pop them to us uh, in the chat. That's no problem whatsoever. And uh, we'll be sending you further tour information in the follow-up email as well. So you can browse our itinerary at your leisure. Okay, Ricardo, if you just want to stop sharing your screen, I can uh, stop that for you. And you now we're going to welcome Jose. Hello, Jose, you're on mute. Hi, Zara, hi everybody, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine, Jose. Now, Thank okay. you very much. Sorry, your presentation may be a little bit shorter than you planned. I know you do have to dash off, but uh, from our point of view, you have the time that you have still 20 minutes if you want to, there's no problem, so. Okay, so thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here this evening. Uh, my name is Jose Antonio uh, Padilla. I've been working for Nature Trek since 2011. I would like to also thank Paul, Tim, and Ricardo. Well, Ricardo has been great to to know about Argentina, I didn't know the great wildlife you also have there, my friend. So thank you very much for sharing with all of us. So in this opportunity, I am gonna be talking about Peru Western Andes, right? And it's particularly a tour that we offer, a nature trek offer that is called Surf and Tour, okay? Because we do a little bit of the Western Andes of uh, central, central Peru, and then we go down to uh, southern of Lima, which is the capital of the country, and uh, to a nice um, protected area called Paracas. Okay, so I'm gonna go through the tour and, um, and I start with the map as usual. Um, this is a map of Peru. Uh, Peru is the third largest country of South America after Brazil and Argentina, of course. And uh, we have three main regions really, no, the uh, coastal region, which is actually desert, uh, is basically the coastal region of Peru. It's the extension of the Patagonia uh, desert that comes from Chile and goes all the way up, you know. And um, and before, you know, it reaches the very um, farther part north of the country, you know, the habitat and scenery changes a little bit because. Uh, we have the Humboldt current that is coming up from the south and uh, before it reaches the north, it turns left and goes down. And in that area, you know, because it meets the other current coming from the north, that is the Nino current, you know, there's a, a handful of their sort of um, ecology uh, habitat that we create some sort of forests up in the north of Peru, but the rest down south is all the, is only desert, okay? Then we have the uh, Andes coming throughout the country. And on the very western side of the uh, Peru, we have the Amazon rainforest that covers more or less 40% of our territory. So in this tour, we start in Lima, you know, uh, which is the capital of Peru. So every flight you know, from Europe, from USA, and even from the UK will come and uh, arrive in Lima, Peru. Uh, Lima is the capital that is in front of the ocean, in front of the Pacific Ocean, and that's where we start the tour. As you can see here in this circle that I made, is very much, you know, what we cover in this particular tour. So we go Western Andes, right? And we go down south to the Paracas National Reserve, and we cover these two amazing habitats. So a lot of people think of Peru, you know, in a way of the Incas, right? Up in the Andes, the mountains and the Amazon rainforest. Not many people think of Peru, you know, in, in, in on the Western uh, uh, slopes and side because there's nothing really there apparently, but we have a lot to offer. And this is why I'm here to talk about, you know, in this very short uh, time that I have. So the tour starting in Lima, but before we go through the tour, 
I would uh, like to uh, show you this limit, this uh, a small drawing that actually explain a little bit how you know Peru um, is made in terms of um, habitats, right? Uh, on the western slopes and western part of the country is very dry. Sorry, it's very dry and desert. You know, uh, we have some rivers going down into the Pacific Ocean from the Andes, right? In fact, we have eight, 28 rivers coming down into the Pacific Ocean. And only along this river is we, where, where we have some life and some vegetation growing. The rest is just desert, as I already said. Right in the middle no, of Peru, we have the Andes, right? Which is all very high in elevation, you know, a lot of grassland up there. And um, this area which not so much diversity, right? But still some very good birds. And on the eastern slope of the Andes, down on the um, right hand side of the screen, we have the uh, fantastic uh, mega diverse cloud forest, as well as the Amazon rainforest down south. No, so this is very much how Peru looks like if we make a cut, you know, through the country, and um, so showing the three main regions that we have here. So the reason why we don't have any sort of vegetation growing on the western slope of the Andes is basically because of the Humboldt current. As I said, now the Humboldt current comes from south of South America and goes all the way up, you know, along the coast of Peru, bringing very, very cold water. So, so because of the cold water, there is not enough condensation and there's not enough heat you not know, to make a sort of, you know, a lot of clouds on the Western side. And therefore nothing really grows around except for, you know, vegetation growing along the rivers. So, but yet, you no, know, uh, we have uh, also some good birds, especially Peruvian endemics that live on this size, not on this side of the mountains or in this part of the country. So here is a, a closer map of what we're doing you know, on this uh, tour. We start in Lima, the capital, right? That you can see here on the left. And first of all, we go east of Lima and in only three hours, we are at the base of the mountains there. And from there, we start climbing up, you know, into the Western slopes of the Andes. And we are gonna do, um, and we're going into this nice sort of valley called Santa, Ul Santa Eulalia, river valley that you can see here, no, um, in, the, in the center. Uh, from Santa Eulalia Valley, we're going up, you know, north, uh, like a northwest, I would say. And we're gonna go through Guachupampa, you know, all around up over, you know, 5,000 meters in elevation, about 14,000 feet. And then we're going back onto the central highway to San Mateo, which is an Andean town about 9,000 uh, 9, feet. And after spending two nights here, we're going back to Lima. And then we're coming down south of Lima into the Panamericana Highway in order to reach the Paracas National Reserve, which is where we're finishing the tour, really. So <clears throat> that's very much what we do. We don't go farther east farther north, which is doing these two main parts of the country. Um, here is a, a, a picture of Lima, the capital of Peru, that is very much facing you know, the Pacific Ocean, as you can see there. The road that you can see down on the left of the uh, picture is the road that will actually go through the whole city. And we make like, um, you know, a very nice sort of, um, a, a non-traffic like road that will take you from north to south and will cut through the whole city, actually looking over the ocean and try to see some of the birds we have here. So this is what we do the first day of the tour. You no. Know? And just along that road that I showed you earlier, um, there are a couple of places that you can stop. And um, then one of the first birds that you can actually see there is this fantastic Inca tern uh, uh, because of the beautiful colors. You know, for some people it's supposed to be the most, beautiful, the most beautiful tern in the world. So you have these nice pictures on the face, as you can see, they, look, they all look like they have like a, 
like a mustache there and a yellow spot just under the eye. And we have this cliff where we can get big colonies of Inca terns just right next to the road, which is amazing. Another bird we're looking for is this Peruvian endemic um, surf synclodes. This is a member, I mean, this is a bird member of the open bird family that live on the coast and right by the ocean that is usually found just jumping or hopping around the rocky areas that we have by the shore. So it's a little bit hard to get, but in some spots that I know, we can get it easily. Another fantastic bird that is also along the coast of, of Lima, just, just outside the city, is the uh, Peruvian thickney. No, uh, no endemic to Peru, found also in Chile and Ecuador in some areas, but they are um, a type of clover and weather that is mainly nocturnal. And because of the sandy coloration that it has, it blends in so well with the sand, you know, on the beach that we have down there. And it's sometimes tricky to find it, you know? but in some areas we actually know where it lives and we look for it with a successful way to find it. In some parts of the, uh, of the city of Lima, before we go up to the Andes, uh, we've, we will stop in a, um, a certain sort of um, villa marshes, you know, some sort of marshes that are by the ocean. And this is another bird easy to get there. That is the many color rash tiger, also known as the seven color of the reeds. You now it's a bird that lives just inside the reeds. So it's, and um, there, and uh, with a little bit of luck, we get it out, we can create pictures like this. Another place that we go and visit, Going down, sorry, going down um, south of Lima, about 45 miles, is Pucusana, which is a fishing bay, you no? Know? And the reason why we're going down there is to try to see Humboldt penguins. This is species of penguin, it's endemic to the Humboldt current, you no? Know, that live along the coast of Peru, down in Chile as well, and in some part of Ecuador. So this is a, a nice view of all the artisanal boats that are out there in Pucusana in this fishing bay that we can all see when we get there. And it's in fact in one of these boats, sorry, in one of these boats that we are gonna go for a, a small boat ride, like you can see here, to see all these um, birds around like Peruvian pelicans, belchers, gold that come very, very close to the boat. And we can create, we can get great pictures of it. Inca turns out. all around and as i said you know the humble ping from uh, the shore so uh, you can see peruvian pelicans here how they come in to actually catch some fish you know by the boat and uh, we can also try some of the peruvian gastronomy in this place after this little boat ride that we do we're going to have a nice uh, a lunch in a seafood restaurant nearby on down in this little town of pucusana and we can try things like ceviche, which is up on the top left. Uh, apparently ceviche, you know, is, well, ceviche is made from Mexico all the way down to Chile, but apparently Peruvian ceviche is by far the best of all of them. And um, we also have some, you know, nice uh, seafood uh, that I serve in these restaurants. So if, you know, Lomo Saltado here down, you know, in the lower part of the screen. So this is what we try and we, we taste after the bull ride. And this is a picture of the Humboldt penguin that was taken by me really close. So we can get really close to this, to this uh, species of penguins on the islands around, you know? and then they don't seem to care much about us. So we can get great, great pictures of it. And um, as I said, this place that we're going to see them is only 45, 45 miles down south of, of Lima. And um, it's only like half an hour, 45 minutes to get there by car. So it's actually easy to get. Huge, huge number of sea lions all seeing in the islands around, you know, uh, and as you can see. And after spending time in the coast of Lima, right, the first day, and after having a great lunch there, as you already seen, we're going, uh, we start going up no, and start climbing towards the western slope of the Andes. So, and this is a picture of the Santulalia River Valley. So you see down there the Santulalia River. And as I already said at the beginning, right? So 
we have 28 rivers going down from the Andes into the Pacific Ocean. And in every river that we have, there's along the river, there's some green and vegetations, a lot of life, uh, you know, inside these trees and inside all these bushes. But as you get past this tree line, it's so dry and nothing else growing around. As you can see, only few vegetations and there, there are a lot of good birds around. This is a, a photo of um, the road you know, that will take us into the Santa Eulalia River Valley. Now, once we get off the main central highway, we go into this dirt road and we start going up. The road is, you know, like. A classic Andean road, and um, we're going slowly, however, and it can be a little bit bumpy in some areas, but we make a lot of burning stops as we are going up, you know, to get some of the birds, some of the birds around that this fantastic Peruvian pick me out, for instance, that is always around and it responds very well to playback. It comes and it lands, you know, usually in wires like this, you know, Peruvian pick me out is around. And one of the uh, five uh, species of Inca finches that are found in Peru, you know, the great Inca finch, um, we, they are five species of Inca finches in the world. And um, in this tour that we're doing, we have a chance for one of the five, which is the great Inca finch. The other four species are found in Northern Peru. And that's it, period. You know, so if you do uh, this trip uh, the, to get the great Inca finch is, is quite easy, in fact. So as we're going, we stop for these birds, you no, know? and um, then we stop in one little Andean town, which is called Huachupampa, which is about 3,000 meters in elevation or 10,000 feet, more or less. It's a, a, a small Andean town, and there's only one hotel there, which is owned by the city which is the place where we're staying only for one night. No, the place is basic. Um, they um, don't provide breakfast or any sort of food, but we do bring a lot of food for the trip. And our drivers are very good, you know, cooking meals out in the field, no? So there's no problem about it. So we can stand there, stay in this little town, uh, even though uh, there's not probably a lot of restaurants around, but we do, we will have a lot of good food made by our drivers and myself sometimes give a little bit of help. Uh, I'm facing a super mega bear for Peru that is around uh, this, you know, little town of Huachupampa way up in the, in the Andes will be, and this is Rufus breasted wobbling finch that we're always looking for uh, is a bird that is, you know, highly localized, is very rare to find. But early in the morning when we start the birding, usually we find it up there in the trees, eating or singing quite a lot. So um, another bird we're looking for around, you know, uh, this high elevation area is the white chick cotinga, which is another super mega bird for Peru. It's a Peruvian endemic. It lives mainly in the Polylepis forest. No, that we have nearby, and um, it's usually found perched up in the top of through the forest. Uh, we actually find it there perch. You no, know, Polylepis is a, a native tree from the Andes of South America. Uh, means you know, poly means many, uh, lepis means bark, and it's a slow growing tree that grows over you know the 4,000 meters in elevation way up there. And that's what the bird is found, you know? The fully lepid forests are a lot protected in Peru and South America for different um, conservation groups that we have around. Another amazing Peruvian endemic that we can find is the black-breasted hill star. Easy to see, it comes down sometimes to the ground to feed on these little, you know, flowers that we have growing very close to the ground. And it perch like this most of the time, and we can easily see through the scopes. Through the scopes, they are fantastic. As I was saying you before, uh, we do have a lot of, um, especially in the first part of the tour, we do have a lot of uh, meals out in the field. No, we bring with us 
uh, the camping chairs, the tables and all that, a lot of food. And, you know, our drivers are well prepared to make food there and have very good breakfast and lunch if it's the case. You know, so you can have a, a, a lunch there in, out in the field, looking at the mountains, looking at the bird photography in the area. It's just amazing, no? In a way, here's another, you know, um, breakfast. I think we might have just lost Jose. The connection has gone for me. I can't hear him anymore. Oh dear. And we were just learning about breakfast as well and out a breakfast at altitude. What a shame. Um, I'm not sure if he's going to be able to come back. I don't know if he's going to be he able got to be Oh, Jose, Jose, you're here. Oh, he's gone. He's gone. Hi, Jose, we can't hear you. I can see you talking though. But I can't hear anything. You were just telling us all about breakfast. That's what I had on my screen anyway. How about now? Yeah, I can, can you, hear you now. Can you, can you hear me? Sorry, I don't know what happened. I got disconnected. Yeah, fire away. Okay, good, good, good. And uh, well, here's the... Um, I think I was talking about, um, hold on a second. I was talking about this nice breakfast we had in the field after seeing this fantastic um, plover, you know, the uh, sandpiper plover that is live around this area. Um, it's um, highly lo localized in this part of the country as well in Chile and Argentina. A little bit in Bolivia as well. I'm not sure if it's in Argentina, but it's in Chile and Bolivia. And um, yeah, I mean, some of the, my friends that were talking before me also talk about this bird because it's just amazing. I have had people on this tour who just came and joined me just to see this little bird that is found way over in the mountains and in these boggy you no know, habitats that we have around. So. Another uh, super mega bird for uh, Peru uh, is this white belly synclodus that looks a little bit like uh, maybe a mockingbird. It lives way up in the mountains as well. Uh, there's a population, I think less than 1,000 individuals left and it's highly localized up there. And I know the spots where to spot and where to stop and actually find them, you No. Know? Um, we have also uh, some species of, for example, Ampita. This is the striped headed Ampita uh, that is uh, also found there, easy to see. It's, it's one of the probably easiest Ampita to actually get uh, in South America, the striped headed Ampita. Uh, another uh, fantastic bird that is easy to see way up there in the western top of the Andes on this tour that we do is the great breasted sea snipe. No, uh, uh, it actually comes out easy to get and we can photograph like this. So it's the Rufus belly sea snipe. No, another Aussie species of, of sea snipe we can get in these tours. You know, it's just a matter of looking well and it's gonna be there, no? It's, and also knowing the spot where to stop and get it. So then um, after we spend the time in the, um, like four days in the Western slopes, uh, in the Western Andes of, of Peru, close to Lima. You now, as you can see here in the map, we're going back to Lima for one night, you know, to have a little break as well, to change some clothes and get ready for the second part of the tour that will take us down into, you know, the um, Paracas, National Reserve, which is about maybe 250 miles down south of Lima. And um, so um, it's just on the Pan American Highway. So we just go into the car the following day. Now, after spending time up there in the mountains, so we just go down into this highway and along the road 
We also make some stops, as you can see here, no? and there are some little marshes um, that are close to the ocean, so we can stop there, look at some non passerines birds, and, you know, like chestnuts, throated seed eater, drab seed eater, but this is very much what we do, easy birding, very open views, no, this is one of the species we look for in these, you know, marshes like parapel seed eater, almost endemic to Peru, we live along the coast, no, and then we finally make it to Paracas, and we make it to this very, you know, beautiful, beautiful hotel. It's a four-star hotel that is facing the ocean, as you can see. That is called Hotel Bahia, no, and it has a swimming pool that we never use really because they never time, but um, for using the swimming pool. But at least we have it, right? And uh, here's a, a view of the hotel at nine, you know, uh, here in the, in the grounds of hotels, it's also good for some birds. I mean, as I said, the hotel have access to the ocean and it's very close to the reserve as well, Paracas National Reserve. And um, so from the hotel in the morning, we can go and do a little bit of birding. Um, Any time during the day, it's good for birding along the shore, close to the close to the hotel. We do a uh, great, uh, we do get a lot of waders, shore birds and all that. And remember, we're close to the Paracas National Reserve. So this is a picture of, you know, uh, of the landscape and the, uh, of the reserve, uh, which is actually protecting about 60% Oh dear folks, it looks like Jose might have gone again. We'll just give him a minute to see if he comes back. The joys of trying to run a live presentation from halfway across the world. We'll just give him a few more seconds. It's not looking like he's going to come back. No, he's gone. Oh, he's coming back. Hi. Hi, Jose. Hi. <laughs> I'm afraid you're know having what... connection issues. You're leaving us on the on the edge of our seats every time you, you disconnect. We're not sure what's happening. I'm not sure either. Can you hear now? Yeah, we can see your comrades now, yeah. Okay, and can you hear me as well? I can hear you fine, yeah. Sorry about that, folks. Sorry about that. I don't know what's going on. I mean, anyways. And, um, well, uh, Wanai cormorants are also seeing around. You know, uh, the name Wanai comes from the word Guano, uh, which is a lot in this island. Uh, then we have... Um, Also a fantastic uh, species of cormorant, red-legged cormorant, and also very easy to get. And the Chilean flamingos that are often seen just by the shore in there. And this is a picture, for example, of a um, the boat ride we do down by Paracas at the Ballestas Islands. No? Uh, we take these uh, big, uh, very fast uh, motorized canoes that will take us from the shore to the islands, right? the Ballestas Islands, and, and here, well, these are big boats, mainly used for local peoples, but we hire one of these boats for ourselves. Uh, sometimes we share it with other tourists, but not many. And here, as you know, it's about half an hour, 40 minutes to get to the islands. And when we get to the islands, as you can see, it's full of uh, birds, it's all covered with birds and all that. So, yep, basically, and um, that's what we do. Uh, there's a lot of good food on the trip, so you know, uh, we have a lot of good uh, fun because we have uh, some of the meals are in the field. There is a nice uh, countryside to see, a lot of Peruvian endemics as well here, no birds that are not found anywhere else in South America. And yeah, great people that we meet on the way, fantastic location, great hotels, especially at the end of the tour. And yeah, you know, always nice to be there. So. Thank you very much, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Paul, Ting, Ricardo. 
for sharing your uh, information with all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jose. That was fantastic. And I'm so pleased that you got to finish the end of your presentation despite having a few technical difficulties. Now, I know that Jose needs to, to head off now, um, but we'll open the floor to questions. And some of you have been uh, putting some questions through to us during the uh, presentations. So I will just allow other folk to uh, turn their cameras back on. And we have uh, Here we are. some questions coming in. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Larissa Cato asking, are there any hikes or walks included on the trip to see uh, the Pumas in Chile? Maybe Tim, you'd like to answer that? Um, yeah, I can't, uh, my uh, video keeps switching itself off. Oh, and same, same for me as well. Yeah. It, it may have been the power cut I had halfway through, but well, you, I think you've blocked me, Sarah. <laughs> you won't let me. No, I haven't. I promise I haven't. <laughs> the host won't let me I, in, according to my, my computer. I'm allowing you to start it. I'm, put, I'm clicking your button. Right. Uh, there, there we go. go. There we go. Oh, okay, so I'll ca carry on with the um, uh, about the hikes. So um, because the focus is pumas, uh, each morning and each evening, we tend to go out looking for pumas going slowly from the roads. And if you get out and walk, the pumas would be off and you wouldn't see them. So that's the main concentration. But during the day, there's plenty of time for other stuff, um, including because we're starting early and finishing late, we usually have a siesta in the middle of the day. And a lot of people just go off and wander on their own at that point, or sometimes come for a walk with me. But uh, so during the day, there is a chance to go walking. It's not mega hiking up the, the mountains or anything, but it's uh, good substantial walks. And all those photographs that I took looking down on the uh, um, uh, on the hotel and the lake was all done from uh, my um, uh, from walks from the hotel. So, yes, there is a chance for some walking. Thanks, Tim. And um... Ricardo, I have a question that you might be able to answer. This is a question from uh, Simon Beckwith asking, do orca um, hunt the sea lions on the beach at Caleta Valdez? No, no, they do not do that in Caleta Valdez. They, they patrol the area, they keep on patrolling the coast, but when they have the opportunity, they will catch them in the water. They don't uh, beach themselves as they do in uh, Punta Norte. Ah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Paul, a question for you. Um, Sheila Thomas. Hi, Sheila. Lovely to see you here this evening. Sheila's asking, does Argentina provide for vegans, the vegan diet? Well, actually, I will pass it over to Ricardo. Who I was just going to say, maybe Argentina. Ricardo might like to answer as well. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yes, yes. Yes, we have improved quite a lot. <laughs> Although we are Argentinians, we are meat eaters. But uh, uh, we have learned and uh, nowadays you can really cater for vegetarians throughout the country, no problem. And uh, is it possible to avoid dairy as well? If people- yes, want As well, as well, yes. Yeah. We, yes, it is something that we have seen more and more easily now. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Ricardo and Mario. Uh, right. More questions. Um, question from John Forrester. In the 2021-22 brochure, there is a best of Chile holiday. There is indeed, John. Uh, however, this is not on the website. Are there any plans to run this trip again? Paul, what is happening with this trip? <laughs> Yes, we are, we are going to be running that trip again, but we're just revamping it at the moment, making a couple of changes. So we'll have a, we'll have a date for, uh, for 2023, hopefully, hopefully pretty soon. Thank you. A question from Simon Banks asking, do any of these trips target dragonflies as well? I'm not sure any of them would specifically target dragonflies, but it may be possible to see them. Uh, I'll put that to, to all of the speakers. Well, uh, dragonflies here in Argentina, you have them a lot in the north of the country, particularly in Iguazú. So, um, but uh, to be honest, we are not really experts in that uh, section. We, we see loads of them on Dow. Yep. Paul, Tim, do you have anything to, to add? 
I, uh, when we were there in October in uh, Patagonia, I didn't see any dragonflies. And I do notice things like that and I draw them to people's attention. So, uh, um, you know, th there were very few of, 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 you know, good feeling dragonfly lakes. So uh, I, I don't think it would be the best of places to go, uh, Patagonia, if it's dragonflies you're after. Certainly places like the Ibera wetlands and as, as Ricardo mentioned, Iguazu are, are fantastic areas for dragonflies. And yeah, I saw lots of them while I was out there. But again, as Ricardo said, in terms of dragonfly ID, uh, that, that may be somewhat somewhat challenging. And I'm sure there's a book at the moment on dragonflies of, of Argentina. <laughs> uh, I have another question here from uh, Jill Vesley. Uh, I'm not sure who would like to answer this, so uh, you can decide. She says that the Humboldt quest, uh, the Humboldt penguin, and South Africa penguin look very similar. Are they the same, or are they related? Can someone please explain it? <laughs> there they are, are three. The same. Uh, uh, does somebody else want to go? I'm happy. No. I, I mean, th there are three: the South African penguin, the Humboldt, and the Magellanic are very, very similar, and they are closely related, the same genus, but definitely different species, different ecologies, different geography. Um, I like there's lots of yellow-crested penguins as well, and uh, uh, many of those, when people study the DNA, have started splitting them. So now there's a northern and a southern rockhopper, and they're thinking of splitting the Gen two into three different species um, on DNA because they all look the same but they occupy different areas so yeah they're, they're related but they're all identifiable and all definitely good species thanks tim uh we have a, a question here from hillary hickmott uh Mott, who's asking how much can be seen in Therese del Pine from the car um if you were disabled or had uh, restricted mobility would you still be able to see a lot from the vehicle perhaps as a, a tailor-made trip yeah, you would. Uh, in fact, most of the stuff is visible. So all those little lakes where we watch the uh, the water birds, uh, all the pumas, the foxes, the skunks, everything there is visible from the roads because that's what we tend to do in the morning and the evening. So uh, and then, um, you know, obviously you wouldn't be able to do the hikes. But when you're on foot in that kind of habitat, you're tending to scare things off. So it's better to be, you know, it, it, it's a good place if you... Uh, have to stick near the car. Great, thanks Tim. Um, we have a question about uh, COVID testing or restrictions for Argentina. Paul, are you aware with the latest of the latest news on, on regulations? Um, oh yeah, yeah, I actually checked a couple of moments ago and of course it could be completely different tomorrow and completely different in a month's time but at the moment, from my understanding, and again, Ricardo might be able to add more, more to this, you need to have to be fully vaccinated and you also need to have a, a test before enter entry. So it's a PCR test, I think, 72 hours before um, or one of the or cheaper lateral flow tests, maybe 48 hours before. But you need to be tested and you need to be double vaccinated um, at the moment. But that could well change over the coming weeks. Yes, you're right. Thanks, Mario. OK, folks, I think that's all questions if you have a question that you urgently want to ask type it rapidly now you have seconds I'll give you a, a minute or two to, uh, to do i'm just quickly flicking through the remainder of our questions um oh, we did have one uh for you tim just to give you an, an opportunity to anyone else to uh, type a question what's the best time of year for seeing puma maybe uh, tim or paul would like to answer this I mean, we uh, we went in October and we saw uh, uh, quite a few mothers with cubs, some with very young cubs, some with well-grown cubs. So October is clearly a very good time, but I'm not aware of what it's like at other times. Uh, you know, we went in October and it was great, um, but I don't know about the other times. Do you know, Paul? Yeah, we, we run our, our Puma, Puma and Penguins trips in January, February, March and, and April. So the first few months of the year. So by the sound of it, you know, from October through to through to April yeah. is, is, is good. So the, uh, the, the, the Patagonian summer and, and autumn, really. 
And my, so my trip was time to go for Jaguars straight afterwards in the Pantanal. It did b both of South American big cats. So, uh, you know, the, uh, so we may have gone uh, pre-season uh, when I did it. But you still did very well by the sound of this. Yeah, that's right. N 19 Pumas, I think it was. Yeah, that, That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> and I think this answers uh, Larissa's question. She says I've been considering uh, combining the Puma trip with her trip to Antarctica. Uh, is October, November a good time to do that? From what you've just said, Tim, I think absolutely that would be a good time to do that indeed. Uh, similarly, Sheila Thomas is asking, does the Southern Chile tour cover similar things to the Big Cats of South America trip? Now, Tim, you just touched on that. Uh, yes, so um, obviously, I mean, pumas are rare, they do take some finding, but and they're particularly active at dusk and dawn. Uh, but during the rest of the time, uh, we're looking for anything else, really, anything else of interest. So we do a lot of bird watching and any other mammals that we can find. I've covered some of them, but uh, not all of them. Um, so, yeah, um, it, it, it is uh, my, my trip was uh, the, the, the big cats tour. Thanks, Tim. Um, and you have a question from Mel Coulson. Hi, Mel. Nice to see you here this evening. Um, he was asking, what about altitude sickness? I'm not sure which uh, location you're referring to. Maybe could have been, been Peru. Probably. Um, or maybe the Andes, because you, you, know, yeah. you could go up to 12,000, 16,000 feet in, in the Andes. But you do it gradually over time. You always sleep lower um, and... Yeah, no, we, we, we're, we're always very careful on, on any of our trips that go up to high altitudes to make sure um, it's done gradually and carefully. And as long as you drink plenty of plenty of liquids and you just, everybody's different. So you need to just keep an eye on yourself. I, I was up 16,000 feet a couple of years ago. And you certainly, you feel it, you know, you feel, you feel short, there's a shortness of breath, but nobody in our group had, had any issues. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, well, I think that's all of our questions for this evening. And I just want to give a, a huge thank you to all of you, uh, Paul, Tim, Jose, Ricardo and Mario for joining me this evening. It's really been a real pleasure to listen to your expertise this evening. And thank you so much for taking the time to just transport us across the world to, to Southern South America. Uh, we hope you all at home can join us next week where we'll be taking you to East Africa, visiting Madagascar, Tanzania and the Seychelles and Uganda. That's on Thursday the 24th next week at the usual time of 7.30pm. You can sign up for it on our website and you'll also receive a link to do so tomorrow in a follow up email from this presentation. So we hope to see you next Thursday and until then, take care folks and we'll see you next week. Thanks all for joining. Good evening. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Good, Good night. evening, all. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ricardo. Thank you, Mario. Thank, Thank you. you, Sarah. Bye.